guys. I'm going to get started, okay? Uh, because we have a lot of material to get through. Uh, this is, I'm Al Vitale. I'm in the Uviatis division and the Benton division as well. Uh, and so we're going to, the goal of this is to give you a kind of a general overview of the um, general principles of epidemiology, classification, and diagnostic approach to, each, to uh, uveitis. So um, in a former life, I was actually doing a similar thing at, at the King Khalid Eye Specialist Hospital in Saudi Arabia, where I spent seven years prior to coming to, um, to uh, the Moran Eye Center. But in real life, uh, my real job is a wild animal trainer. This is my wife and uh, four monkeys. So my training began actually in Boston uh, with uh, <laughs> these kids. So you can see I'm much younger there. And uh, there are three children that are the same age and a kid that's just a year and a half older. So this is our gang of four. Um, we, uh, I finished fellowship training, went to Saudi Arabia, and this is actually a picture of uh, us in front of Kennedy Airport on the day that we're leaving, and that is a triplet stroller. And uh, my son seems to be looking at me like, you sure you know what you're doing here? Are we really going to Saudi Arabia? And uh, it turns out it was a pretty good place. It's my wife uh, with her hands full, literally, uh, at a place uh, near Saudi Arabia on the beach during the first time that we actually had a, a break. Um, about six years into uh, Saudi Arabia, we were on a, a camping trip out in the uh, empty quarter, and I suggested to my wife that maybe you know, that we had this great opportunity to come to, to Utah. She said, Utah, really? Uh, again, I mean, you know, desert to desert, uh, fundamentalism to fundamentalism, <laughs> you know, prohibitions on alcohol, you know, cultural conservatism, and what's the, with this polygamy thing, you know? So, you know, because, you know, in Saudi Arabia, it's big. And I said, no, really, uh, we can do what we like to do outside of our front door, and indeed, we love to ski. Uh, and, you know, there was a time when I, 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 I mean, I still ski with my boys, my, my, daughters, um, and there was a time when follow me guys was actually a safe thing to say, and really what's more dreaded is like follow me dad guys, because I really don't want to ski behind my boys anymore, because they get you know upside down and dangerous. Um, this is my son Ryan, who was a competitive longboarder. These guys pretty much are going about 65 miles an hour down concrete roads. If, you're, if you want some entertainment, uh, uh, go on YouTube and, and uh, kind of search when reindeer attack. He has this collision at about 55 miles an hour with this reindeer, which is pretty, pretty impressive. Got a lot of hits on YouTube. He's alive and doing well. My daughters are uh, like to get air as well. They are uh, have been competitive equestrians, and my daughter Sophia continues to do that. Uh, my son and I like to surf a lot. We go to a lot of different places to do that. Um, the photo on the bottom right is a place called Scorpion Bay, where I hope to be um, in a week. So. Hopefully there'll be some surf there. Um, my family has really thrived in uh, Utah. These are my kids, they've grown well. And then on the right, uh, my kids and our adopted friend, Kellen there. Uh, we frequently have get togethers around the holidays that involve people from the Rent Eye Center. As you can see, Dr. Shakur, Dr. Uh, I, I think, who is that there? Uh, Renee Choi and a couple of other people. So, and then we have our other families in Mexico and around. So. Um, people that are living at home now are two dogs. Uh, my daughter is living there for, for the time being. So they're really, uh, we're not quite empty nesters and we're still, you know, kind of crazy after all those years. So I just want to give you a little introduction about me, um, you know, as well as you guys. So here we go, we're getting into, you know, the meat of this. So uveitis really, the word uvea comes from the Greek, uh, from the Latin for great. Um, uveitis really is a, a generic term that refers to intraocular inflammation, in, intraocular inflammation, but really comprises about 30, more than 30 separate entities, which can be distinguished based on their clinical features and disease-specific treatments. Broadly speaking, I think it's helpful to think of uh, ocular inflammatory disease as either infectious or not infectious. Uh, many of the not infectious uh, entities are auto-inflammatory or autoimmune. And of course, you always have to keep it neoplastic masquerade syndromes in mind. Um, it is a leading cause of blindness worldwide, uh, probably the fourth or fifth cause of blindness in the United States, and represents about 10 to 15 percent of total blindness in the United States, and may be the fourth or fifth cause of um, visual loss after diabetes and age-related macular degeneration. 
making it an important cause of visual loss given the fact that it affects uh, people of working age and may, the economic and personal impact may be greater than that of age-related disease. Um, the approach to the patient with uveitis, you know, for the interns here, for Ariana, you know, um, you never really escape, you know, being a, a doctor in uveitis. As William Osler said, you know, um, if you want to know what your patient has, talk to them, listen to your patient. He's giving you the diagnosis. So history is really important, okay? Both ophthalmic, medical, and then by uh, means of a review of systems which we conduct with the patient and ask them to fill out um, uh, before their uh, visit. Then, of course, the ocular examination and general medical examination to the extent that you can perform it in the, cl in the clinic. Um, you can get a lot of information by looking at skin lesions and the joints of patients. Um, and then the formulation of the differential diagnosis, which is probably the single most important thing in the workup of a patient with uveitis. So how do you create a differential diagnosis? Um, you characterize the intraocular inflammation along several different dimensions. One, where is it located in the eye? What is the anatomic location? Two, what is the presentation, course, and laterality? Is it unilateral, bilateral? Is it acute or chronic? Then a description of the lesion morphology, the number of lesions, the, the uh, uh, descriptors uh, of the lesions themselves. We'll go into all of these. And then there are host factors. Is this a intraocular inflammatory condition that is associated with a systemic disease? or is it a purely ocular condition? Um, a corollary to that is, obviously, is it infectious or not infectious? Probably the most important, one of the most important differentials, uh, distinctions that you need to make, obviously because you do not want to treat an infectious disease with um, steroid medications. And then, what is the immunocompetence of the patient? The typical characteristic uh, morphology and uh, uh, phenotype of certain types of disease in an immunocompetent patient will look completely different in an immunosuppressed patient. Uh, then, you know, what is the uh, demographics? Uh, you know, where is it, where in the world is the patient coming from? What is their ethnic background? As the world is smaller, you will see unusual diseases here. Plus, uh, there are certain um, disease entities that are more common among certain ethnic groups. And then, of course, the associated signs and symptoms. So. Here you have a patient with a, um, a rash of erythema migrans, a targetoid rash, which in the correct clinical context is diagnostic of Lyme disease, okay? No more tests, right? Um, so directed laboratory investigation, and I underline directed laboratory injection um, investigation, which is based upon your uh, differential diagnosis and your leading uh, candidates for diagnosis are, is used to exclude infection to identify a systemic condition that may impact on the systemic health of the patient and to provide prognostic information for the patient. Okay, so there are certain uh, laboratories that may allow you to characterize the inflammation. So HLA B27, as we will see, is, character is associated with acute anterior recurrent uveitis. Um, and you can, if you identify that, uh, you know that you know, up to 83% of those patients can have an associated spondyloarthropathy uh, and so a referral to a rheumatologist is critical. And then you can also tell the patient that you're going to have a kind of recurrent type of disease, not something that requires uh, uh, anti-inflammatory medication for a lifetime. And then the formulation of a treatment plan. And that involves antimicrobial therapy, you know, in the case of an infectious disease, and then um, anti-inflammatory therapy in a step ladder approach, which we will discuss. Then assessing your treatment, see if it's working, right? and then to monitor for the side effects and toxicity of your treatment. So there is a group called the SUN Working Group, the Standardization of UBI's Nomenclature, and we uh, met about a decade ago to try to agree on what we uh, are talking about when we describe uh, inflammation in the eye. So we agreed to agree that we would characterize inflammation based on an anatomical classification. There are many different ways to classify inflammation in the eye, but a very useful classification is anatomy. Where in the eye is the predominance of the inflammation? Is it in the anterior segment, anterior uveitis, or is it intermediate uveitis, which is concentrated in the gel, the vitreous, and the peripheral retina? Um, posterior uveitis. Posterior uveitis, by definition, requires a lesion in the retina or choroid. 
not a structural complication like macular edema or optic nerve head small or even vasculitis. So lesion in the retina and choroid. Or a panuveitis where there's inflammation in all three compartments. So these are some uh, just graphic examples of, you know, anterior uveitis with hypopion uveitis in a patient with Bichette's disease. Intermediate uveitis, this is looking beyond the lens into the gel of the eye, and you can see it is chock full of cellular material. This is a posterior uveitis with a core retinal scar and adjacent satellite lesion, which is um, characteristic of toxoplasmosis. And this is a, is a exudative retinal detachment in a patient with VKH, um, which, take my word for it, is a panuveitis. So this classification system is good, but it does not include, I think, some important, very important entities, which we, were, they were un, which we didn't address or are important to consider, and that includes keratouveitis, so inflammation or infection uh, involving the, the, um, the cornea and the anterior chamber. So keratouveitis, in my mind, is herpetic until proven otherwise. Um, scleroveitis, likewise, in patients that have scleritis, um, will not infrequently have anterior uveitis or posterior uveitis or, um, you know, uh, subretinal fluid. That's important because it, in about 50% of the time it can be associated with a systemic condition and rarely with systemic conditions that are potentially lethal, okay, such as uh, GPA. Then the, there's the whole problem of retinal vasculitis, which can be primary or secondary, so the vessels can be involved in a variety of diseases, either as a primary vasculitis or secondary to um, <coughs> infection or inflammatory disease, uh, or as a part of a systemic vasculitis, which is uncommon. However, it's important to identify um, those as, as systemic conditions, such as lupus or uh, GPA or polyartery synodosa, because that impacts the systemic health of the patient. And then, um, the differential diagnosis can also be further honed down by um, identifying which vessels are involved. So there are certain entities that predominantly involve the arteries, such as uh, uh, herpetic uh, necrotizing retinitis, or those that predominantly involve the veins, such as sarcoidal associated uveitis or intermediate uveitis. Um, what do you mean when you say you know acute or chronic or recurrent disease? Okay, so you. When we talk about the onset of inflammation, we, it's either sudden or insidious, and the duration is either limited or it is persistent, and limited arbitrarily would be something that lasts less than or equal to three months. So that an acute disease is one that is of sudden onset and limited duration. A recurrent disease is an acute disease that has episodes that is punctuated by periods of inactivity for greater than three months, and a chronic disease would be persistent inflammation that has uh, inflammation with prompt relapse after tapering treatment. So it's important that, uh, you know, people communicate that uh, correctly, you know. Um, there is no such thing as, you know, uh, an acute chronic disease. I mean, you would, the, people put these words together all the time, not really thinking about what it is that, you know, they're saying. So I think that it's important to, you know, use these kind of words correctly because it's useful in communicating what it is that you're talking about, because it can tell you what the disease is, and I'll show you what I mean. So you, another way that UVI's had been classified is kind of a clinical description of whether or not it's granulomatous or non-granulomatous. This is not a pathologic definition, but more of a clinical definition based upon the appearance of the inflammatory precipitates on the cornea or on the iris, and these are non-granulomatous fine keratic precipitates, which are not particularly specific, but these are granulomatous in contradistinction that look like kind of greasy, larger, so-called mutton fat, uh, you know, stuck on uh, precipitates, and this is an inflammatory nodule on the iris. Okay, so if you see this, then your differential is a little bit more narrow because there are um, a limited number of diseases that can present uh, as granulomatous disease, such as sarcoid sympathetic lens-induced disease, a drug or foreign body, VKH. Notice that herpes and syphilis can do whatever it likes. So um, it is not specific, okay, but, uh, and always keep in mind that herpes and syphilis are the masqueraders that can do pretty much anything they like. So this very busy slide just kind of lists on this axis the anatomic location and this, whether it's infectious, um, 
systemic, non-systemic. The point of this disease, uh, the point of this slide, is to point out that syphilis, tuberculosis, and sarcoidosis, and you know where it's endemic, Lyme disease, can really do, uh, can present in all different anatomic locations of the eye. Okay, so always have that in mind when you're thinking about UBI's patients. So here are some some illustrations of the major anterior um, uveitides. Uh, they are listed here in infectious, systemic, and non-systemic disease. This is an example of a patient with um, herpetic uh, uh, keratouveitis with sectoral iris atrophy, which, by the way, is not pathognomonic of varicella infection, so it can happen in simplex as well. This is a patient with B27-associated disease with a hypopion uveitis, a collection of white blood cells uh, in the anterior chamber that layers out. Uh, this, uh, in contradistinction, is a patient with chronic uveitis in a child that has a white eye with juvenile idiopathic arthritis and a structural complication of a cataract. Uh, this is a patient with uh, mutton fat KP, posterior sneakia, uh, in a patient uh, with anterior uveitis and sarcoidosis. And this is a guy with two different color irides with Fuchs heterochromic keratocyclitis. Uh, the major entities uh, to think about uh, in intermediate uveitis are infectious diseases such as syphilis and uh, Lyme disease. The major systemic illness, uh, illnesses that can occur with it include multiple sclerosis, which is an important consideration um, in select patients, and sarcoidosis. And then if there is no associated systemic condition, it is termed pars planitis. Okay, so pars planitis is idiopathic intermediate uveitis. The different, uh, the, one of the most common structural complications and cause for visual loss is uh, macular edema. There are frequently collections of what we call snowballs or inflammatory exudates in the retina. This, these would be non-well circumscribed, uh, you know, vitreous opacities, which would be indicative of, of active disease. And phlebitis, that is inflammation affecting the, um, the veins. As you can see, there's sheathing of these vessels, and it's more prominent on wide field fluorescein angiography, as you can see here. Okay. Um, posterior uh, uveitides, um, uh, you want to know where the primary level of uh, inflammation is, whether or not it's in the retina or in the choroid. I showed you this example previously. This is uh, toxoretinitis, where the inflammation is in the retina. This is tuberculous choroiditis, which you can appreciate clinically that maybe the lesions are a little bit deeper than in the retina. So it's important to um, identify the location of the lesions, but also the character of the lesions themselves, whether or not there's one or, or uh, two lesions, or there are multifocal lesions, right? So this is be posifocal, this is multifocal, whether or not it's located in the posterior pole, okay, or if it's peripherally located or it's diffusely located throughout the fundus. And then the color, size, and shape of the lesions. So for, oops, sorry. So for example, this is an amoeboid geographic choroidal lesion that is characteristic of serpiginous choroiditis. This is a placoid lesion at the level of the pigment epithelium that is characteristic of ampi. These are orange, yellow, ovoid lesions with a streaky appearance uh, in the choroid, which are very characteristic of birdshot. These are punched out lesions with atrophic appearance and hyperpigmentation around them that we see in patients with multifocal choroiditis. And these are barely discernible, small, white, cartwheel type of lesions that come and go uh, in the, and are so-called and are characteristic of evanescent white dot syndrome. In the posterior segment, um, major infectious entities are listed here. This is a patient with CMV retinitis, which is a multifocal retinitis. This is a patient with sarcoidosis with many, with multiple things happening here. There's vasculitis, there's vitritis, um, there are chorioretinal atrophic spots, and uh, there is, there is retinitis as well. This is a patient with an unusual kind of variant of, um, of ampi on the, on the spectrum 
of AMPI that is more relentless. Uh, it's called relentless plactoid cortical retinopathy, which uh, is characterized by multiple spots that kind of progress towards the posterior pole and recur. And recur. AMPI usually doesn't recur, but they have similar characteristics angiographically. And then panuveitis. Always think about syphilis. Seriously, always think about syphilis. Um, Lyme disease uh, is similar in a uh, endemic area. And then the, uh, some systemic conditions include VKH disease. This is actually a lady with VKH disease, which may be difficult for you to, to appreciate, it, but the, there is neurosensory detachment of the retina here, which is more easily seen on fluorescent angiography, which shows this pooling okay, of uh, dye into these large areas of uh, neurosensory detachment, which is characteristic of that disease. And this is a patient with multifocal cortis uh, and sympathetic ophthalmia. Okay, so you have all this kind of nomenclature, right? And uh, you have this, these descriptors of the disease in your, in your mind, and it enables you to actually, I think, communicate effectively when you're describing disease, right? So a unilateral alternating recurrent anterior uveitis first thing I'm thinking about is an HLA B27 associated disease, okay? As opposed to um, a unilateral chronic anterior uveitis, there are a couple of entities that I would think about. So Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis or herpes. Um, a unilateral recurrent focal retinitis, as so we showed a couple examples here, toxoplasmosis. Th those would be the kinds of things that would come to, to mind, as opposed to a bilateral chronic multifocal cortis might see in patient with birdshot or multifocal choroiditis. So when we assess a patient, we're in the business of vision, right? So uh, critical things to look at are best corrected visual acuity, right? Intraocular pressure uh, and a standardized grading system to uh, kind of uh, quantitate the level of inflammation in the eye. So the sun group, uh, have come up with this classification system, which uh, classifies inflammation on a scale of zero to four plus, based on actually counting the number of cells in the eye on a one by one millimeter slit, as you can see here. Okay, so there is variation between you know one. There's about ninety five percent agreement with a variation of one grade, which I think is pretty good. One also assesses flare, okay? So flare is analogous to this uh, jungle kind of scene I saw in India while I was traveling there, which this is moisture in the air, but flare in the eye is leakage of protein from incompetent vessels, um, and it is a marker of chronic inflammation and chronic disease. And uh, one grades flare by uh, grading at zero to four plus depends, depending upon the degree to which it obscures the structures in the anterior chamber. Similarly, one grades the haze in the vitreous. This is the NEI grading system for vitreous haze. It is not a, a perfect scale by any question, by any stretch of the imagination, because what we're talking about is haze in the gel of the eye that is obscuring structures in the back of the eye. Obviously, there are other things can, that can produce haze, right? So corneal opacity or nuclear opacity. So one attempts to uh, mentally, you know, take into consideration those those entities. So, you know, grade of zero is crystal clear, and a grade of four is like no view to any structures in the back of the eye, and then it's graded between three and trace in between that. So the Sun Group could not agree on a, vitre a vitreous cell scoring system, um, predominantly because it's really kind of you know unwieldy to think about even starting to count these numbers of cells in the eye. But I think that it is still something that people use, okay, uh, in uh, rating inflammation to denote active or inactive inflammation. So when you look into the back of the eye, and we, can, we will do this in our clinic, um, some patients with chronic inflammation will have cells in their eye that are not active, that are stuck onto the vitreous fibrils or that are pigmented. Whereas other patients will have cells that are floating around in the clear or free lacunae spaces of the eye, which more are more indicative of active inflammation. One may also see aggregates of cells of uh, 
so-called snowballs in the eye. Uh, with fluffy, those with fluffy borders would be indicative uh, of active inflammation, whereas those that have been treated, the cellular aggregate may not completely go away, and it may remain with um, well-circumscribed borders. Uh, in addition, when you know this toxoplasmic lesion that I showed you previously, I should probably put that in here. But you know, one can see actually cellular inflammation in the vitreous gel over the lesion, and it's important to to note that because when you treat that lesion, the, that inflammation should should dissipate. So these are all kind of markers are of inflammation. So when we work up a patient, why why in the world do we do this? You know, well, we talked about this. You exclude an infection identify systemic disease impacting help, guide appropriate treatment, and provide prognostic inflammation. So the principles are to be selective, right, based upon your differential diagnosis. What are the most, what are the leading causes that you're thinking about, right? So if you look in the back of the eye and you identify toxoplasmosis on your indirect ophthalmoscopy, HLA-B27 is not a test that you want to order on the patient, okay? Um, you want to stage the workup from from the more common to the more rare. As I mentioned to you, always consider the masqueraders such as syphilis or infectious diseases, sarcoid, and TB in patients that may have an endemic or exposure history. And then always think about masquerade syndromes. Just always have it in the back of your mind to think a little bit outside of the box. That is neoplastic uh, disease that may simulate an infectious or inflammatory disease. So syphilis testing. Um, in general, we screen with both a specific and a non-specific treponemal test. Um, as you, uh, there is a new recommendation from the CDC, which I won't get into, about reverse sequence testing. Uh, but in essence, um, one uses two different tests to um, exclude the possibility that a patient <clears throat> may have had actual syphilis that has become dormant either in time or with treatment because tertiary syphilis is something that you don't want to miss and can, one can see that in patients with uveitis. So RPR and uh, FTA or the reverse sequence testing, which this lab doesn't do on a routine basis. Lyme disease testing is, I think, important in patients that you know, have a history of exposure in an endemic area, right? Sometimes the history will, will tell you what the patient has. Seriously, I had uh, my mother-in-law called me on the telephone and, and said, from New Jersey. I said, oh, my side of my face is all droopy. And I said, really? Have them draw a Lyme titer when, they, when you go see your doctor. She had, you know, facial palsy due to Lyme disease. And, uh, you know, it's very, very common. It's common in New Jersey. It's common where she lives. It's a common manifestation of disease. Okay. Um, Testing for tuberculosis. Um, well, you know, testing for tuberculosis with PPT and quantifurin gold is pretty sensitive and specific. The problem with routine testing for every patient for tuberculosis with uveitis is that the uh, prevalence of the disease in the general population is really, really low, okay? So that the positive predictive value of that test would be very poor to be used as a screening test. On the other hand, it is very helpful in patients in whom you think you want to exclude that diagnosis, right? So a person that presents with iris nodules and chronic anterior uveitis, a um, patient with a choroidal tuberculoma, as you see in this picture, there's an entity called serpiginous-like choroiditis that you must exclude tuberculous exposure in, um, and then multifocal choroiditis in an immunocompromised patient. Then, of course, there are patient factors. You know, so we see refugees here, immigrants, um, elderly people, and then those with significant exposure risk. And then, of course, in anybody in whom you're considering placing on systemic immunosuppressive therapy, especially biological therapy. Um, targeted uh, laboratory testing is useful uh, in patients with, for example, that present with a neuroretinitis, as you see here. So Bartonella is the leading cause of neuroretinitis and should probably be excluded. History of cat scratch is always helpful, but not always, uh, you know, forthcoming. West Nile virus in a patient that presents with kind of these targetoid type of lesions that may, you know, in September or um, August or you know October, which is West Nile season. Seriously, I was giving a talk 
last year um, to you know some some people here in September, and our fellow called me and said, I got this patient that has these funny lesions, blah blah blah, you know, and this patient ended up having West Nile virus, you know, so we got West Nile titers, and she had drenching fevers, you know, oh okay, um, yeah maybe we can talk, we'll talk about this in detail, but it's useful. You wouldn't get West Nile virus on a patient with anterior uveitis, right? So there's be no clinical indication to do that. And then PCR of the aqueous or vitreous is extremely useful in confirming the diagnosis, confirming the clinical diagnosis of necrotizing retinitis. On the other hand, routine screening <coughs> is of limited value in patients for um, varicella or herpes simplex disease because the majority of the patient population is going to be seropositive for that. Similarly, toxoplasmosis, routine screening is not going to be valuable um, uh, because of the high seroprevalence in the general population. I mentioned this to you, a patient that comes in with non-granulomous antrioviatis, first episode, may have a history of back pain. Half of those patients are going to be HLA B27 positive, and up to, you know, 80% of them will have an undiagnosed spondyloarthropathy. That's a useful test. Um, ANA is not a useful test as a routine screening test for patients with uveitis. Lupus rarely causes inflammation in the eye. It can cause vasculitis, but rarely uveitis. On the other hand, you, children with anterior uveitis um, should be screened with ANA because uh, oligoarticular um, juvenile idiopathic arthritis is a leading cause of chronic uh, anterior uveitis. Similarly, a beta-2 microglobulin uh, and serum creatinine are useful screening tests in patients that present with bilateral simultaneous anterior uveitis for the, for the diagnosis of tubulo interstitial nephritis and uveitis syndrome. And then um, ANCA rheumatoid factor uh, would be useful in patients with scleritis. Um, as systemic diseases are associated, 50% of these uh, of scleritic patients and rheumatoid and rheumatoid disease is the number one systemic association. Um, just a word about sarcoidosis. Um, it can produce any type of uveitis. Uh, the organs most likely affected are the lung, skin, reticular endothelial system. But really, you know, uh, the joints, brain, heart uh, are important uh, organs that are frequently involved. Um, people will not infrequently use ACE and lysozyme uh, as screening tests. They're the utility of which is probably not very uh, helpful. Uh, I don't think, unless the patient has active disease in which they are generally high. Um, similarly, abnormal liver enzymes may uh, point you in the direction of sarcoidosis if they're very high in patients with liver involvement, but really chest x-ray is probably the most useful screening test for patients with sarcoidosis is it's abnormal 90% of patients with active disease. And in patients in whom you have a high clinical suspicion of sarcoidosis, and I have a normal chest x-ray, repeating that test with a high-resolution CT scan may be very valuable because it may identify uh, lesions that are missed on routine chest x-ray. The diagnosis, really the definitive diagnosis is that a tissue diagnosis, of the, um, uh, particularly you know, in the lungs, but you know, look for extraocular sites, you know, like the skin, without having to do an invasive bronch. Uh, or even the um, uh, lacrimal gland. So ancillary in uh, imaging is also important in the workup of uveitis, as we talked about with chest x-ray, sacroiliac films, uh, CT and MRI, but uh, ultrasonography, you know, obviously in a patient with mediopathy, uh, one would not want to have a surgical adventure in this eye with these, you know, uh, detachments. And UBM, AI, is, is helpful uh, in identifying the causes of hypotony, uh, which you can't really see on your examination. So the identification of a ciliary uh, membrane or ciliary body detachment. We will talk about multimodal imaging, which is really critical in the evaluation of patients with posterior uveitis. Um, fluorescein angiography is alive and well, I think, in uveitis. Um, it is a very sensitive imaging modality for the detection of active uh, disease particularly retinal vasculitis, um, and can also identify areas of non-perfusion, which I think require uh, treatment in patients with occlusive retinal vasculopathy, which one sees in patients with uveitis. And then ICG angiography, as we were discussing 
yesterday in floor scene, rather uh, last Thursday in floor scene uh, clinic is useful adjunct in patients with uh, cortical uh, inflammatory disease. Obviously, um, OCT has kind of revolutionized our, uh, our uh, view of the back of the eye in providing you know, quantitative uh, information, information and structural information, particularly uh, it, it, as far as the, not only just macular edema, but you know, what's happening in terms of cortical nevascularization uh, and in the outer retina. And I think that OCT and geography will become uh, very important in the identification of uh, and distinction between corneal retinal inflammatory disease and corneal neovascular disease. And finally, uh, fundus autofluorescence likewise is, is I think quite useful in identifying um, uh, atrophic versus active diseases in uh, certain types of white dot type of uh, syndromes. We do use uh, full field electroretinography for global tests of uh, function in certain diseases such as birdshot retinochordopathy or in patients with uh, autoimmune type of retinopathy where the retina is, is uh, globally affected and then visual field testing. Likewise, um, our useful uh, objective uh, modalities to follow patients that are being treated for these diseases with immunosuppressive therapy. So, treatment in 20 minutes, but um, I just want to kind of go over some general principles of treatment, okay, so that you have an idea of how we kind of approach patients, okay? So the really important thing in treatment is to establish a diagnosis. You may not have a, you know, I mean, 40% of the diagnoses, uh, or maybe 35% are idiopathic diagnosis, or you may not have a diagnosis, et cetera, but you have thought about what you need to do, right? So it's important to exclude an infection. So you don't want to treat, an, you want to treat an infection appropriately, but you don't want to treat an infection with a anti-inflammatory regimen. So establish the diagnosis, rule out infection and malignancy, and then treat inflammation appropriate, infection appropriately with uh, antimicrobial therapy treat the um, inflammatory disease in a step ladder approach, and then always reconsider your diagnosis. Just watch the patient, don't get tr go down a rabbit hole and don't look back, okay? So some people will have an atypical response to their therapy. Maybe your diagnosis isn't right. You really have to be prepared to rethink things. And then be, um, you know, be astute to new findings as they emerge. When you see patients, always, it's, it's a new opportunity to reassess them, right? So the goals, elimination inflammation, you know, uh, suppress chronic activity, try to induce remission, which is hard to do, treat and reduce prevent ocular stru structural complications in order to preserve vision and to avoid and minimize systemic complications. So you want to eat, you know, have your cake and eat it, okay? I think it's possible to do that. This stepladder algorithm, I really don't like algorithms in uveitis. I mean, I think you think about each patient individually, but this is just a general guideline. You start with steroids, okay? Steroids are the first line of treatment, and from whatever, uh, you know, route and as frequently as you can. So topical steroids, uh, periocular steroids, intravitreal steroids, uh, and then systemic steroids for brief periods of time because we try to limit the total exposure of steroids from all routes as, as much as we can. So we use them to put out acute, to treat acute inflammation, but try to limit the total exposure of steroids given the steroid side effects. And then have a low threshold for the um, introduction of steroid sparing immunomodulatory therapy, which involves both conventional agents, which we'll, I'll just give you an overview of, and then biological agents. And then there are cases in which diagnostic vitrectomy is necessary, diagnostic tissue and fluid sampling. So uh, the best route and choice of medication is really determined by the location of the inflammation, the laterality of the inflammation, the potential ocular complications, and the systemic health of the patient, right? So topical steroids are very useful um, in patients with anterior uveitis, but not so much, you know, for people with posterior uveitis because the medications don't penetrate to the back of the eye, whereas periocular, intravitreal, or systemic steroids 
are useful, with or without immunomodulatory therapy, are useful in patients with, immun uh, with intermediate posterior and panuvitis, uh, particularly when it's uh, uh, bilateral for systemic disease. So this slide just kind of summarizes, um, you know, in a box fashion, if you think better this way, you know, we use topical steroids for intermediate posterior and panuvitis, in which there's anterior uveitis. Okay? But periocular steroids are more preferentially used um, in intermediate and posterior uveitis. Um, so, how to use topical therapy? Um, you know, we deliver um, high doses of, of steroids usually, so you don't start out with twice a day, but you, if you have inflammation now, you want to treat the inflammation with um, a uh, healthy frequency, four to eight times a day of, of topical medication. And then once there is, uh, the inflammation is down to you know 0 0.5 plus or zero, um, then uh, begin to taper the medication. Um, we frequently will also apply cycloplegics in patients with anterior uveitis, um, both to move the pupil so that you protect the patient from developing posterior sneakia, and also um, to for uh, for pain management in patients with ciliary spasm. Periocular steroids can provide local and uh, sustained drug delivery for about three months um, with no real systemic side effects. Um, and the indications are best really for acute and remitting non-infectious uh, disease, uh, intermediate posterior pan uveitis. So this better for that than chronic disease, okay? Um, can be used primarily, say for example, in a patient with unilateral intermediate uveitis. Um, uh, it can be used adjunctively in patients with, who develop macular edema who are on systemic medication. Uh, it is frequently useful in patients with macular edema. Um, the contraindications for a periocular steroid injection, I think just always think about that, are infection, right? So you don't want to treat a patient with toxoplasmosis with a periocular injection because you have a depot steroid back there that can make the uh, infection run wild. Similarly, scleritis and corticosteroid uh, intraocular pressure uh, responses are relative contraindications depending upon the need for that treatment. Um, there are a couple of different preparations. We generally use triamcinolone here. There are a couple of different ways to deliver it. One can give a, a um, uh, orbital floor injection, um, or a posterior, uh, or a um, subtenons in injection. I generally deliver it, uh, you know, through the orbit. It's an orbital floor injection when I do it, which I've been doing a lot less often these days, because I think it's better tolerated by the patient and it's easier to do. Um, and I think that the side effects are, although they are similar in terms of. Uh, Cataract and elevation intraocular pressure, um, I think they're better tolerated, actually, with the orbital floor approach. They are equally as efficacious, at least in the studies that have been conducted. So irrespective of the route, you can get resolution of inflammation about 30 to 60 percent of the time um, with improvement of visual acuity. And there's a historically um, an additional benefit of repeated injection. We will have some new data coming out you know, in about three, two months, which is comparing different routes, which will be interesting. We can inject the steroid into the eye, okay, an intravitreal injection. Um, it is quite effective in the immediate reduction of macular edema and of uh, inflammation in the eye with improvement of vision and decreased vitritis. The duration really varies depending upon you know, the disease entity and whether or not the eye is vitrectomized or not. Um, there is a formulation uh, of dexamethasone, uh, the so-called Ajodex injectable implant, which is uh, uh, a biodegradable polymer with lactic acid and glycolic acid, which degrades into carbon dioxide and water, which has been approved for the use of intermediate posterior pan uveitis. Um, it is effective in reducing vitreous haze, macular edema, and visual acuity compared to sham in the approval trial with little complications, okay? Um, and uh, no cataract, but you have to remember that these studies are short-term. So it's a six-month study, 
patients without who, patients who were steroid responders were excluded from the study. So real life, okay, use of dexamethasone um, is shows efficacy um, at a, I think a reduced um, durability uh, platform. You know, from rather than six months, but more like two to four months in terms of its durability and. Um, Indeed, uh, it is effective in reducing central macular thickness and vitreous haze, but it comes at a cost with repeated injections of elevated intraocular pressure in cataract. So this is just a kind of a summary slide, uh, you know, showing periocular steroids and intravitreal steroids, um, showing basically that they are moderately effective, I think. Um, there's this clinical impression that intravitreal injections may be more effective. I think that's probably true. Uh, but that uh, the, there is more um, of a problem with uh, ocular side effects, uh, elevated intraocular pressure and cataract. Um, and that there are additional benefits for repeated injections, but it comes at a cost. Uh, and then one interesting, uh, I think, clinical uh, observation is that patients that are on immuno, systemic immunosuppressive therapy require fewer adjunctive treatments than patients that are not. So um, the problem with regional corticosteroids steroids is that they're relatively short acting. They are not really that effective for chronic inflammation because it would require uh, multiple uh, administrations of steroid in the eye with the cumulative risk of cataract and intraocular pressure. <clears throat> with each relapse, you're, you're treating relapse, right? So with each relapse, you have this little hit on uh, structural function, I think. Uh, in the eye with uh, kind of a sawtooth decline of function. And I think that's been pretty well demonstrated by certain entities that have been managed that way historically in the past, such as birdshot, um, which does not respond well to intermittent therapy, either with uh, periocular, intravitreal, or systemic corticosteroids. There is a device called the Redisert device, which has been shown to um, provide a sustained uh, delivery of flucilone acetamide into the back of the eye. It has been approved by the FDA in 2005. Uh, reduction of uh, rate of uh, inflammation, uh, reduction of the rate of adjunctive corticosteroids, um, and effective in the short term, you know, in, in while the implant is still active, but it comes at a cost, okay? And the cost is 100% development of cataract in phagic eyes. Okay, 70% um, development of the need for <clears throat> adjunctive topical anti glaucoma medications and 40% um, uh, incidence of incisional glaucoma surgery. That's pretty high, okay? So if you're, it's effective, but you have to keep those risks in mind. There is, um, an NDA has been submitted to the um, the FDA for a flucinolone acetonide intravitreal insert, which is a similar idea, similar compound, but delivered in an office setting. Uh, so the medication is actually alluded onto a polyamide cylinder, which is injected in the eye like dexamethasone. Um, so we will see. It preliminarily um, is actually pretty effective. It may be a really great adjunct. Systemic corticosteroids are used frequently in patients with bilateral disease. Uh, for acute therapy, <clears throat> we can also we usually uh, dose it at a milligram per kilogram, or usually at a maximum about 60 milligrams a day. The reason for that dose is that uh, data from the rheumatologic uh, literature suggests that uh, doses greater than 60 milligrams a day are uh, associated sometimes with uh, are more places patients at greater risk for aseptic necrosis of the femoral head. So usually around 60 milligrams for a couple of weeks and then, then uh, tapering the medication. Um, we can also give it by IV pulse as the neurons uh, frequently will do for optic nerve disease. And then we always supplement patients <coughs> with calcium and vitamin D and then use anti-resorptive agents, I think in patients that are postmenopausal or greater at risk, abnormalities on their DEXA scan, <coughs> which we obtain on a yearly basis of patients including, and we also monitor their weight, just to keep them honest, um, and to help them with uh, you know, side effects of that medication. Uh, there are uh, guidelines for the use of immunomodulation, uh, uh, immunomodulatory drugs, 
Uh, this was a paper that I think you should all read at some point in time. It was published in 2000, but I think it has some very useful information uh, by the lead authors, Doug Jabs and AJ O in 2000. And basically, um, one uses immunomodulation in patients that fail systemic steroids, and that would be patients with unacceptable side effects of the medication, um, diseases known to be poorly responsive to corticosteroids, and then requirements for chronic steroids that would be at doses of greater than 7.5 milligrams for three months, as this dose is likely to produce, to produce uh, more serious side effects um, over the long term. There are some disease entities that require immunomodulation at the outset of disease, given the um, natural history of those diseases. And those include patients with Bechet's disease with posterior segment involvement uh, and retinal vasculitis, patients with ocular uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid, serpiginous cordopathy, patients with necrotizing sclerosis and sympathetic ophthalmia. <clears throat> and there are a whole group of diseases in which we actually start immunosuppressive therapy pretty early, given the fact that we know that the natural history of those diseases is poor with steroid monotherapy. Birchot is a good example of that disease. Um, juvenile idiopathic arthritis is another good example of that disease in which you know, you don't want to treat children with long courses of systemic corticosteroids, nor do you want them to be on topical steroids for long periods of time to prevent both systemic and ocular side effects of steroids. So convention, we, it's useful, I think, to think about immunomodulation in two large categories, conventional immunomodulation and biological immun immunomodulation. Conventional immunomodulation, by definition, modifies some specific limb of the immune system. It, it can inter the mechanisms include interfering with uh, DNA or protein synthesis, specific receptor or ligand antagonisms, such as interleukin-2 receptor in patients with cyclosporin, or tr signal transduction um, receptor blockade. And then the anti-inflammatory effects, it's not really well known, even in patients with methotrexate, where it's less of an immunosuppressive and more of an anti-inflammatory medication. Um, so the, the major drugs uh, that, are, that we use in UVIs that are conventional agents are listed here. And again, you know, I'm, I, I'm simply simple-minded. I like to think of things in groups, okay? So anti-metabolites, what, what are the anti-metabolites? Methotrexate, mycophenolate, azathioprine. That's what we use mostly. T-cell uh, transduction or calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin, tucker and then the alkylating agents, heavy, heavy guns, right? So we use them less frequently because we now have biologic agents, but the ones that we have used are chlorambucil and cyclophosphamide. And those medications do come at a cost of, you know, um, at least some increased mortality in patients, in certain groups of patients with alkylating agents, more severe uh, side effects. But they are, I think, the only medications that have been shown to really induce true remission of inflammatory disease. So, as I was alluding to earlier, how do we treat patients? Acute care with steroids by whatever route we need. If we're contemplating placing a patient on, say for example, a conventional agent like methotrexate, um, we use systemic steroids frequently as a bridge or maybe an intraocular steroid as a steroid bridge because the um, time uh, with which anti-metabolites become active, maybe two to three months, okay? So we want steroids to ramp down and then the other medications to ramp up. We want to closely monitor the patients with the development of toxicity and then we tell the patients that they need to be monitored uh, in the laboratory because the medications are, uh, may suppress the uh, immune system <coughs> and are metabolized usually by the liver with the exception of uh, tacrolimus and, uh, and cyclosporin, in which renal indices need to be monitored. This is kind of a summary slide of data from the site study, which is a really great study of five very large UVI's practices, um, which gleaned a lot of information about the use of these medications. Um, and it basically shows uh, what is the outcome uh, of, uh, of monotherapy these medications. And as you can see, um, you know, methotrexate and mycophenolate are about the same 
okay in terms of their efficacy in steroid sparing effect and toxicity. Cyclosporin is a little less effective and is not usually used as monotherapy, but it's useful in combination with these other medications, I think, because it has a different mechanism of action. And azathioprine is used less commonly, but may be used. And then cyclophosphamide um, has the highest rate of inactivity, but the greatest and the greatest rate of remission, but also the greatest rate of complications. Um, you need to know about the MUST trial, okay? This is a trial that uh, looked at the, um, the, it was a randomized controlled clinical trial that compared the flucinolone implant versus this kind of systemic algorithm that I just described, okay? The bottom line of this study depends on when you look at it, okay? So the two-year results of the study show that the visual outcome was similar for both groups. Inflammatory control was a little bit faster and greater with the implants than systemic therapy that was statistically significant, and that systemic therapy was well tolerated. As expected, ocular complications were seen of cataract and interocular pressure elevated glaucoma surgery in patients that were implanted. However, when these patients were followed over seven years, um, at about year five, there was a crossover uh, in terms of efficacy, so that at seven years, um, the uh, treatment favored systemic therapy to the implant with a significant difference in visual acuity uh, between the two eyes. And this was thought to be due to the uh, occurrence of new cord retinal lesions in patients in the implant group, despite crossover. So you can see this at you know about year five or six, where you have this crossover of these two curves here in the left. There was initial improvement in macular edema in the implant group, but then again, um, it became the um, same at about five years and better for the systemic treatment. Um, so I think that the take home of this, there we can discuss this for an entire session, okay? And I think it's worthy of discussion. But um, I think that the take home of that is that, not that systemic therapy is pretty better. You have to individualize this to a patient, right? So that initially systemic therapy may be preferred initial treatment in a patient that can tolerate systemic therapy um, due to the variable effect of regional steroid, but the implant is an excellent alternative in patients that have uncontrolled inflammation or intolerance to systemic medications. Biological response modifiers, these are the other major category of immunomodulation. Uh, I just if you give me two minutes, I will go through it. I know we're, we're at 8 o'clock. So what they are are recombinant anti, you know, antibody-derived proteins. These are the uh, list of about eight uh, biologics that are used in uveitis. The ones that you will see more often in clinic include infliximab and adalimumab, which are TNF-alpha inhibitors. Um, Enbrel is a, a fusion protein, which is very effective <coughs> in treating arthritis, but not effective in treating UVS. So an expert panel, like the one that in 2000 was convened, and uh, which showed, which concluded that infliximab and adalimumab, those two TNF inhibitors, are useful as first-line agents for patients with Bechet's disease and as second-line agents in JIA, so cyclitis. And then are um, potential second-line agents in uh, patients that fail at conventional immunomodulation. Um, infliximab is, deliver is a uh, chimeric antibody. Mouse human antibody is delivered IV. Uh, we frequently use it in combination with an anti-metabolite like methotrexate to reduce the incidence of anti-chimeric antibody and for its added efficacy. Um, there, it is a uh, effective medication with is steroid and sparing. However, just so you know, biological agents are not really remittive agents, okay? So you remove them and many patients will have recurrences of inflammation. The advantage to using infliximab is that you can adjust the dose a little bit. You can assure compliance. So it's IV, the patient has to be there to get it, and then you can actually uh, dose it monthly or every eight, eight weeks, and there's variability in the dosage if the patient doesn't uh, respond. Adalimumab is a fully humanized um, anti-TNF uh, antibody which has been approved by the FDA for 
UVI's. So it's the first biological agent that's been approved for UVI's. And we have been using it more and more uh, frequently in our clinics. I think the concerns that you need to know about the TNF inhibitors is that there's a definitive increased risk uh, for infection, so all patients are screened, screened for tuberculosis. Um, there is an increased risk, at least in certain populations, of lymphoma. And I think that we need to talk to our patients about that, but the patients that are the, the most at risk for that are patients with autoimmune disease that would be at risk for the development of this anyway. That's hard to, it's a hard sell sometimes in some patients that are very risk averse. And then of course, um, it can increase the risk of demyelination. So in any patient that has any um, history of multiple sclerosis or in patients with pars planitis who are at risk for developing multiple sclerosis. One should be circumspect and just automatically prescribing it. So in patients that we put on this medication that are young women with intermediate uveitis, we get a thorough history, and even in the absence of any history, I will scan that, okay? Um, so there's variable response to TNF therapy. So TNF isn't the answer, right? There are a whole bunch of other um, biological agents that are in the pipeline and that are actually, that we use. Um, so what, what do you do if uh, you, if a patient fails Humira? Well, you can put them on another TNF, anti-TNF medication, as I mentioned to you. So Humira is uh, subcutaneously administered. It's a fixed dose, okay, of 40 milligrams every two weeks. Uh, sometimes patients will respond to infliximab who, who don't respond to Humira. And uh, they are dosed monthly at higher doses of the medication. Uh, there are uh, some other anti uh, TNF agents that can also be used, but there are a whole other classes of biological agents which target different receptors. Okay, so infliximab and Humira target TNF alpha, which is a pro inflammatory cytokine, but there are many other pro inflammatory cytokines that are um, up or downstream for that that have been shown to be very effective, such as rituximab, which targets CD20 B and B cells, um, anakinerum targets IL-1, uh, IL-2 inhibitors, and then tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 uh, medication. Interferon so I, are used uh, actually very effectively in patients with Bechet's disease and chronic macular edema, but the literature comes from Europe, and I, for some reason it just not has, has not caught on in the United States, primarily because of the, probably the insurance hurdles in, in getting people on it, and the 100% uh, development of side effects that are kind of nasty flu-like illnesses and depression, but I actually have a patient that is on this chronically for macular edema, whereas nothing else has worked for them. Um, so is this stuff effective? Well, it is actually effective in patients uh, with JIA uh, in reducing ocular complications such as hypotony, epiretinal membrane, and blindness in the better seeing eye. Um, and in this site cohort, which is where the probably the best data comes, there is a significant reduction in the risk of visual loss, uh, particularly for patients with less than 20-50 vision. Um, cancer risk is something that uh, you should know about. These, these agents can, are, can be associated with increased risk, but this, again, the same site study <clears throat> showed that there was no increased risk of cancer-related morbidity or mortality associated with anti-metabolites or calcineurin inhibitors. There was a signal for increased mortality in patients with biologics, um, but that is in a very small number of patients, and there's actually very, there's good literature in, in the non uveitic um, experience in GI uh, and in rheumatology, which shows a much less risk uh, of this. Okay, so, I mean, that's a lot of material, and I don't expect you guys to, you know, take all these things home, but I really wanted to give you some, you know, real uh, kind of a broad overview of how we approach the patient and what we treat them with, you know. So there is, it is not a random process. It, there really is a way to approach a patient, uh, both diagnostically and uh, therapeutically. And this will become much more obvious as we see patients in the clinic. And then we can discuss these treatment uh, and diagnostic modalities in more detail.